the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings it's amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life that i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done an exciting day for you, uh, exciting day to celebrate with you today. Uh, we're celebrating baptism as well as just uh, celebrating our community and just being together and enjoying fellowship. 
um, and praising the Lord. Amen. Um, we've got a, a, a wonderful set to worship with Jesus this morning. Um, if you would just join us as stand as we all uh, um, sing this next song, I'll just pray us in real quick. Lord, you are so wonderful. You are so worthy of praise. There is no one like you, Lord Jesus. Not in all the earth, not in all the universe. <laughs> you are so wonderful and so kind. Father, we honor you this morning and say, be here with us this morning as we celebrate. Would you draw close to us, Holy Spirit? Hallelujah.
count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out working all things out yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless your name When my heart is heavy all my days, oh yes I will. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me. so worthy of praise. Our souls cry out, Abba, Father, blessing and honor and glory to you, to you who gave your life for us when we didn't deserve it. Hmm. Lord, and you didn't deserve what happened to you on that cross, and yet you took it upon yourself. for our good, our benefit. How wonderful are you. 
How kind are you? How gracious are you? How wonderful are you, Lord? Yes, I will praise you. Yes, I will. You are worthy of praise. You are worthy of adoration. Praise you, Jesus. going to continue in our worship this morning by taking the elements together as one church, as one body. As you came in this morning, um, there's little tables with cups, with little tabs of bread on top. If you feel free during while I'm talking, just to come and grab some, but hold on to them. We're going to take it together. If you're joining us from Facebook this morning, just grab whatever is available to you. We're going to do this together as, as Christ instructed us to uh, remember him honor him for the good works that he performed on the cross. you never fail God and you can even take the the bad and make them into good you transform ashes to beauty you can take a terrible work like the cross and turn it into the most redemptive act in human history who is like you Jesus we remember your broken body on that cross as this bread represents. Lord, and we accept it. We accept your body and your sacrifice. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Let's take the bread together. the cup. Jesus, you spilled your blood. The blood of God was spilled for us. The blood of the Most High King covers our sin. Jesus, we honor you. We honor the blood that you spilled as its juice represents, Lord. We accept your gift and praise you for it. Thank you, Lord. Let's take the cup together. We're going to continue to worship him this morning. And as we do, just... Keep that truth in your heart that it was his blood, his perfect life. He who had, who had done no wrong took our punishment. Who is like you, Lord? We worship your name, Lord. We worship you.
whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i worship your holy name your rich in love and your slow
stay rooted in the love that calls us by name. When seasons change and troubles come, you will stay. Jesus, we say yes to you this morning. Sit upon the thrones of our heart. We say yes to you, Lord Jesus. We say yes to you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We say yes to you. Faced with your goodness, Lord, what else can we say? That's right. Here I am. That's right. It's all for you. That's right. Take all I have. It's all for you. That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It is awesome to see you all here today. Pray the Lord blesses you as we gather together to worship and celebrate and enjoy His presence. I'd like to invite you to do something for us, if you would, and this is true if you're watching on Facebook or if you're uh, here in the auditorium, that is to take a moment and fill out one of our Connect cards. Uh, if you're in the room, in the chair pockets, on, if you're on the front row, they're behind you, everybody else there in front of you. Uh, there's a card that looks like this. These are a great, invaluable tool that we have available that uh, really just helps us to know how we can best serve the needs of the community and how we can uh, uh, best love and, and nurture uh, the people of the church. Uh, it takes about 20 seconds to fill it out. That would be an awesome thing. If you prefer to do it online, you can go to cobvineyard.com, and at the top of the page, there's a button that says Connect Card. And if you click on it, it brings up something that looks very similar to what you see on the screens now. Uh, and again, it just helps us to have an opportunity to know if there's something going on that you'd like for us to be praying with you. There's a place for you to put in prayer requests. If there's something going on you're celebrating, we'd like to know about that as well so we can celebrate with you. Uh, if you are new to Cobb Vineyard, there's a place for you to indicate that as well. And that gives us an opportunity to write back to you and send you a small gift and say thank you for being here in a tangible way. Uh, so if you'll take a second to do that, that would be awesome. Uh, also, uh, we have several things that are going on in the church we want to make you aware of, so take just a moment and check this out. Hey guys, today is Community Sunday. After the service, we'll gather for lunch. It's all followed by a Kona ice truck experience, and it's all free. And a great time to fellowship and get to know people better. We hope to see you there. Hey Cobb Vineyard. We are hosting a worship circle on Thursday, October 21st, from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, what a worship circle is, it's where we gather as a community 
with any and all instruments that you can play and just worship Jesus uh, in a circle and make a joyful noise to Him. So if you can play any instrument or if you just can sing or if you just want to be a part, we would love to see you there on October 21st from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Can't wait to see you there. We have an amazing opportunity to reach hundreds and probably thousands of people through our Trunk or Treat Outreach October 31st. After last year, word on the street is this is the can't miss event. One family said that this is the best event they'd ever been to. To have this powerful of a representation of the church and the love of Jesus to our community takes all of us working together. First, join us in our candy drive by dropping off candy in the designated bins in the lobby. We also need all of us to serve our guests at the activity, concessions, and game booths. You can also serve on our parking and greeting team. Our goal is that this will be much more than an event. It will be an opportunity to build bridges to the community. Let's all be faithful stewards of the favor God has given us to impact hundreds and hundreds of people. He is sending us. Together we can change lives and have a blast doing it. Hey, Comp Vineyard family. One of the coolest things I think about our church family is that we are a praying church. We pray every Tuesday and Thursday and every second and fourth Friday of every month. We have a core of people who are so faithful to come out and pray with us, but we want you. So this Friday, we are gonna be praying at Swift Cantrell Park at seven o'clock under one of the pavilions. So please make an effort to come. I know that we're all longing for change, change in our lives, change in our community, and we want to see God show up. So come and expect God to do big things things and come and pray with us as the church family this Friday, seven o'clock. See you there. Awesome. I didn't know they were going to put that beautiful woman at the end. <laughs> Woo! That was awesome. A uh, couple of other things I want to make sure that you are aware of. One, uh, as our uh, food pantry uh, continues to, uh, to move forward, uh, we want to go back to offering um, ministry prayer for people that uh, are coming to the food pantry. And so if you are interested in being a part of that team, that's going to be starting back up on November 6th, which is the first uh, Saturday in no uh, November. And so we'd love for you to come and be a part of that. And you can talk to Anita uh, for details about that. Second thing I want to make sure you're aware of, November 7th, Don Curtis, who leads a small group Sunday school class, uh, and has been Facebook only uh, for the last several months, is going to be uh, restarting back uh, to in-person, 9 a.m. here uh, in Classroom 1. And so uh, 9 a.m., November 7th, non-Sunday school class will uh, be meeting over here, and it'll also be available on Facebook at the same time. So I uh, want to make sure you are aware of those things. Okay, well, what we're going to do this morning is I want to take just a few minutes and finish up uh, talking through Acts chapter 10, which is part of our series as we're going through Acts. Well, that's an interesting looking picture. Um, but anyway, uh, so we're going to look and finish up in Acts chapter 10, uh, and then we're going to have an opportunity for baptism. Acts chapter 10 literally leads, uh, leaves us at the point of uh, experiencing baptism. The people in the story are experiencing baptism, and so we'll kind of be entering into that same spirit uh, uh, that Acts chapter 10 uh, leaves us in. Uh, as you know, uh, as we have been tracing through this chapter, uh, fascinating, fascinating things happening. Phenomenal chapter of Scripture because what it does is it takes uh, Christianity from uh, essentially a Jewish sect and moves it into the mainstream of a worldwide uh, movement as God is redeeming and restoring and reaching out to people from all around the world and uh, every tribe, every tongue, uh, every nation. And uh, Acts chapter 10 really is the linchpin moment uh, when that uh, transformation takes place. Remember, it starts, Acts chapter 10 introduces us to a man named Cornelius. Cornelius was a God-fearing, devout, um, generous to the poor, uh, prayer warrior. The problem is 
Cornelius wasn't converted. He didn't know about Jesus. He hadn't given his life to follow after Jesus. Uh, but an angel of the Lord appears to Cornelius and begins to talk to him and says, Cornelius, your, your prayer and your intercession has come up before God. Your generosity to the poor has come up as a remembrance before God. And what you need to do is you need to send uh, for Peter and have him come. And so Cornelius does that. He sends guys out. Well, in the meantime, at the same time, God is... Uh, ministering to Peter and showing Peter something. Peter, uh, all of a sudden, he gets hungry one day. He goes up on the roof waiting for lunch to happen, and a sheet comes down, and it has all of these uh, different animals in it. Some uh, would be very familiar to uh, Peter as far as something to eat. Some of them would be things that he had been taught all his life he shouldn't eat. And as he looked at that, he heard a voice telling him, Arise and eat, Peter. Uh, you can have this stuff. And he was like, no, I've never done that. I've never gone that way before. And, and the Lord spoke to him and said, that which God has made clean, don't you call unclean. And as he's trying to figure out what's happening, all of a sudden the guys from Cornelius show up. And uh, uh, the Lord speaks to Peter and says, says, there's some guys down there. I've sent them to you. You need to go with them. And so that's kind of where we pick up the story uh, in Acts chapter 10. Um, Verse 23, uh, it says this, the next day Peter started out with them, meaning the guys that had come from Cornelius, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Now one thing that Luke doesn't tell us as he's uh, telling the story is how long they had been gathered together. How long it is that uh, they had called the relatives and friends together. I don't know if it had been a day. I don't know if it had been an hour. They didn't have cell phones. They couldn't call ahead and say, hey, we're almost there. Get everybody together. You know, They had to just be prepared for it. They had to be in this situation. But what I love about this is that Cornelius was expectant that something was about to happen happen. He was in that place of expectation that God was about to do something. God had spoken, God had promised, God had given him direction. And, and so Cornelius, in obedience, was moving into an area of expectation of God showing up and doing something. And, and I, I, again, I don't know uh, if they'd been there, because at this point, this is uh, probably three days or so after Cornelius has sent out his servants to go and try to, to get Peter. So, uh, and it was about a day, day and a half to two day uh, journey. And so, so there was a, an amount of time. But for them, I kind of have a feeling they didn't care how much of uh, a, a lot of time it required. They didn't care how long it took them. They just knew that God was getting ready to show up. And they wanted to be in a position to be ready to hear from what God has to say. And so he called his relatives. He called his friends. And they came into his house, and, and there they are. They're waiting for Peter and uh, the entourage to show up. Verse 25 says this, As Peter entered, his, entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up, said, Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. You know, I don't know about you, but if an angel of God showed up to me and started talking about somebody else by name, I think I would have a pretty good bit of reverence for that person. I would think, you know, I, I don't know a whole lot, but God knows this person. God calls this person by name and sending him as a messenger to me. This guy's got something going on. And so when Cornelius sees Peter walk up to his door, he just falls on his face in, in reverence and, and in respect and honor. And, and, and uh, Peter immediately says, oh, no, no, get up, get up. I'm just a man just like you are. I love this because... As this story unfolds, and as we've talked a little bit about in the last couple of weeks, Peter had all kinds of reasons to see a real distance between he and Cornelius. See, Peter was a Jew. Peter was a Jew. And, and as such, Peter had been taught his whole life, Jews do not associate with Gentiles. We have nothing to do with it. We, we are separate. All of his life, he had been taught, if you bump into a Gentile, you need to go. You're ceremonially unclean. You need to go and be cleansed. You know, he, he had been told all of this stuff, but all of a sudden, God had done something profound in Peter and had moved on him in such a way that he became aware that he was a man, I'm a man. We are equals in this. Uh, I, I love this because uh, even... 
in our culture, we have a tendency to elevate people. We have a, a, a tendency to look at people and we think, oh, this person, this person is up here somehow or another. They're high and mighty. They're, they're so different. You know, we're, we, we, somebody walks into the room and all of a sudden we think, oh, I know that person. We start getting nervous and our palms start sweating and we become aware of, oh, this person is somehow other than me. This person is somehow other than me. Even in the church world, we have that happen sometimes. You know, you see, you see people that you see on TV or, or people that you've heard of or you've followed, you've read their books, and, and, and there's that element where you just uh, are excited. And, and I think that it's great to honor people and to respect people and be thankful for people, all that kind of stuff. But if we ever, ever, ever lose the reality that they're a man just like I'm a man, they're a woman just like I, you know, that, that they are, they're, there's, they're, they're, they're not, I'm not a woman, thank you, Lord. Um, but if we ever lose the understanding that God is great and I am not, that God is great and I am not, and God works powerfully through you, but I see God, it's God. I know, I recognize that it's God. And we, we, we uh, uh, have to live with that understanding. Anytime we start thinking of ourselves as somehow or another, I'm God's special anointed one. You know, y'all hear me quote John Wimber a lot, but one of my very favorite quotes that I ever remember hearing from John Wimber was, uh, people would come up to him and say, John, do you, do you think you're an apostle? Do you think, you know, God has called you to this special... John would say, I'm not an apostle. I am just a fat man trying to get to heaven. <laughs> and I just think, you know, that's, that's a good place to live. It's a good place to live when you recognize God is great. God is awesome. God is amazing. I'm so thankful, you know, um, so thankful. Let me move on. <laughs> Verse 27 it says, while talking with him, Peter went inside, found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you're well aware that it's against our law for a Jew, a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? I love this because Peter has no idea why he's there. He hasn't realized yet what's about to unfold. He doesn't know, do they, is somebody sick? Does he, does, do they need healing? Did they call me because of that? Because Jesus one time or several times would get called over because somebody needed healing. What, was somebody dead? Did they need a resurrection from the dead? I mean, Peter's just there, you know, what, what's, what's going on here? Why, why have you sent for me? And so Cornelius proceeds to tell him the story. He said, the other day I was praying, an angel of the Lord appeared, told me to send for you, and, and so you've come now, and we're so thankful, and, and it's been very gracious of you to come. And then down in verse uh, 33, he says this, and this is like every preacher's dream, okay? Now, we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. You know, we're, we're just here. We're just hungry. We want to hear every word, you know. Uh, so often for preachers, it's more like, remember when Peter was speaking? I can't remember. I think it was in Ephesus, and he's speaking, and then the one guy falls asleep and falls out the window and dies, you know. It's like that's the way we get it most of the time. We don't normally have somebody, oh, we're hanging on every word. But that's the way uh, Cornelius's whole uh, family and relatives and friends, they're all hanging on every word. And so Peter begins to speak to them. And, and remember, this isn't a, a, a sermon that Peter has prepared for months. You know, I'm going to give this to Cornelius' house. It's going to be incredible. He's, he's, Cornelius has said, you just tell us whatever's on your heart. Tell us whatever you have to say. So in verse 34, he begins. It says, then be, uh, Peter began to speak. I know now, I now realize how true it is. That God does not show favoritism. You have, to, you have to know what a profound revelation this is. This chapter is as much about the conversion of Peter as it is about the conversion of Cornelius. I mean, it, this, is, this is profound, something that has been ingrained in him his entire life. The whole nation of Israel is founded on this idea that we are God's favorite. 
That God somehow or another has, 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 has shined on us in such a way that, that we, we among all the people, and the Old Testament talks about that, we among all the people are God's chosen treasure. And so the, they took that to mean at the exclusion of everybody else. At the exclusion of everybody else. They never realized God has set his favor on us so that through you, you can bless everybody else. It was for everybody else. They didn't understand that. They didn't realize that. But, but all of a sudden, Peter begins, uh, he has this vision. Now, all of a sudden, he's in a Gentile home, and they're open and hungry to hear, and he's starting to realize, whoa, God really doesn't show favorites. And, and, and I think that it's an astounding statement that Peter may be even just saying to himself, it's true. Peter, you better get your arms around this. God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, with the Holy Spirit and power, how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We're witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. The contrast of that, he went around doing good, healing all, delivering all, setting people free, giving them truth so that they could live full lives and in every direction. He went around doing good. And how did they honor him for that? They killed him on a tree. They killed him on the cross. And I'm sure that uh, there, there was a part that Peter was wanting to drive home. Remember what uh, Paul tells us over in Galatians where he says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a cross. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. This, this man was, Jesus of Nazareth was considered cursed. They saw him that way. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day, caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed. And hear what Peter says to him. He is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living. And the dead. He is the one that God appointed. Now you have to understand a judge is someone who exercises authority and power over all those in his courtroom. And in a very real way, Peter here is communicating this Jesus, God has established all authority, all power is in his hands, and we are his subjects. We are the ones in his courtroom. We have to understand that a day is coming when God, in the person of Jesus, will demonstrate his authority, will demonstrate his judgment, will demonstrate his power in the earth. And then he says this, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Wow, what a powerful. Remember how we started Acts chapter 10. We asked a question, and the question was this. How good is good enough? How, you, you, look at, you look at Cornelius' life. It says he and his whole family were God-fearing. They were devout. They were generous to everyone who was in need. That they were uh, people that were given to prayer. And you know, We joked around that you know, in our day, if somebody walked in with Cornelius' Um, uh, resume, we would say, this is Elder Cornelius, welcome, we're so glad you're here. He had so much, but he was unconverted because he didn't understand the pathway to having his sins forgiven. You know, I've regularly said this, there are two ways to be acceptable to God. The first way is to be perfect. So, you know, if, if you're here and you are perfect, you could be acceptable to God. The problem is most of us blew that when we were out, I don't know, four months, five months. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not sure at what point, you know, but, but somewhere along the lines. But 
other than that, there was something that Cornelius and his family and his friends understood is there is this ache within me. There is something inside of me that causes me to know that there is a distance between me and God. And I recognize that, that at times I've blown it and I've tried to do penance and I've tried to do the right thing. I've tried to work as hard as I could to, uh, you know, to make up for all of this stuff. But I know in my heart of hearts that it's not enough. I know in my heart of hearts, I have not gotten to the point that I've uh, 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 obtained that forgiveness or atoned for my own sins in some way. I need something outside of me. And I believe that that's why the angel showed up to Cornelius and, and communicated to him, send for Peter, he'll explain it to you. Send for Peter, he'll explain it to you. And here he tells them. He says says that when you believe in the name of Jesus, it it offers to every one of us the forgiveness of everything we've ever done. Every time that we've blown it. Every time that we promised to do and knew the right thing to do and failed to do it. Every time we knew the right thing to do and did the opposite. All of that. He says that when we believe in Jesus, when we trust in him, when we submit our life to him, that there is this, there is this uh, freedom that comes as the forgiveness of sins, as his blood washes through us and cleanses us and sets us free, that it transforms our lives and changes us forever. And I love this because they just hear these words. There is forgiveness of sins. And look what happens immediately. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words. Remember here, here, this is a group of people who are desperately hanging on every word that he has to say. These are, are people who are desperately listening to everything that Peter, that God has put in Peter to communicate. And as soon as he says, when you believe in Jesus... There's a forgiveness of sins. And it says, while he's speaking these words, they begin to open their hearts to God. They begin to experience the outpouring of his spirit. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they uh, heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. They they recognize, they've experienced the Holy Spirit in the same exact way we've experienced the Holy Spirit. There's this commonality. We're all in this thing together. It's not Jews and Gentiles. It's not Gentiles become Jews and then they can become Christian. No, no, no. God has reached into all the nations and is drawing people to himself. God has reached into all the nations and is accepting and drawing people to himself. And the Holy Spirit has come to confirm that thing that God is doing in the earth. What a profound, profound story of Cornelius' conversion. But can I tell you something? Every one of us sitting in this room have a profound story of conversion. Every single one of us. Some of you, you, you know what it's like to live separated from God. You, you know what it was like to live a life that was not centered in Jesus. You, you've experienced a, 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 a profound transformation as God has reached into your heart and has, has changed you. Some of, some of you sitting in this room, I know you came out of the womb speaking in tongues. I mean, you were just, from the get-go, you, you followed the Lord. But I, I'm telling you, you can look around to the peers in your age group, whatever age group that is, and you see what could have been. And you see the profound hand of God that he's had on you all the days of your life. The, the, the pathways that he's protected you from. The pathways that he has, has brought you into. I'm telling you, if, if you're sitting here and you say, you know what? Yeah, I, made a, I, I prayed a prayer to receive Jesus. Yeah, but I, I don't know that my life has changed all that much. I challenge you to check your conversion experience. Because Jesus wants to transform your life. He wants to transform your life. He wants to allow your life to be, to be transformed into the image of his son. 
so that more and more and more you become, you begin to reflect the life of Jesus that he has deposited inside of you that will flow out of you. So then it says this, then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. One thing that is very obvious is that every time someone comes to faith in Christ, there's, there is something that the scriptures encourage us to follow through right on the back end of that. And that's water baptism. Because water baptism is an outward sign of an incredible thing that God has done inside of us. When we, when we see the, the symbolism of, of the water, we understand that, that the story of the water is, is really a place of burial. It's, it's, a, it's, it's taking the old life and burying the old life because God has promised us that we're going to have a whole new life, that he's going to raise us up to new life. And so, and so the symbolism of, of the baptism is that the person enters the water, but as they go under the water, the old life is being buried. And that, and, that, and that when they come up out of the water, they are coming into a whole new life. Whereas before, there may have been a life that was uh, centered on serving themselves, being successful, doing all of the different stuff. When they come up out of the water, they come in, uh, up into a life that says, you know what? I want Jesus to be the center of it all. I want, I want my passion, my goals, all of my life. Success is defined by my relationship with Jesus. Everything is centered in my relationship with Jesus. And that's the beauty and the glory of baptism. That's the, the, the fantastic reality of baptism. You know, I, I can just tell you, there are few things. Sorry, this is personal. There are few things that are more meaningful, fulfilling, I don't know what the word, than ever having the, the opportunity to baptize your own, your own kids. Amen. This morning we have a very double special treat, and that is that my grandson is going to come and be baptized this morning. So um, uh, I think first... John Fittner, my fellow grandfather. <laughs> I'm not sure how we're doing this, so. He's ready. So, okay. Talk loud. I'm loud. It's one of my gifts. It's on. All right, it's on. Um, it, it's it's an incredible heritage. That you have. We are so proud of you. Um, all right. I'm good. No. Um, just as I as I was praying for this day, um, the Lord gave me a picture of of you leading leading an army. <laughs> and just know that that you are going to do amazing things, and we've known it. Since the day you were born, we love you. We're so proud of you. All right, so I'm going to put you in. So we're going to do this thing, okay? Is it warm? Yeah. Can you sit down? Okay. So Jason, Jason's been asking to be baptized um, for about a year now. Um, pretty much every time it comes up, he's begging for us to uh, to baptize him. And we really wanted to wait. We wanted to, to make sure that he knew what he was doing. Um, so, Jace, I'm going to ask you a few questions, okay? Jace, have you made a decision to follow after Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. Okay. 
Is there anything else that you want to say? No. Well, Jace, it is my privilege and honor to baptize you in the name of the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. We love you. I know that one thing that regularly happens when we have times of baptism is that there are people that show up and, and maybe they didn't let us know that they wanted to participate. But as you sit here, you know what God has done inside of you. You know that God has brought new life. But you've never publicly declared that. You've never acknowledged publicly outwardly what God has done inside of you and so I always want to give an opportunity if you're if you're here this morning and you've never publicly acknowledged life in Jesus you've never outwardly declared the old has passed away and all things have become new and today you want to do that I want to give you an opportunity Water's good. Amen. Amen. Well, why don't we, uh, yeah, we can do this. Why don't we stand and sing this song? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory. King above all kings shakes the whole earth. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing.
and I'm going to um, give you some directions about lunch. So, because we're going to eat here in just a couple of seconds. But before we do that, um, I always on Baptism Sundays forget that we're supposed to take up an offering, and I always forget ah. that. So, I apologize for that. Uh, but we have some folks that are um, going to come up front. I think we do. Maybe we don't. We will now. Sorry about that. They forgot too. It's not just me, it's contagious. But they're going to come up front, and what will happen is they'll walk through. I know many of you uh, give a lot of different ways through the mail, uh, online, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, Father, I just ask now in the name of Jesus that you would bless this offering. God, we ask that you would use it for the glory of your name. Lord, I thank you for this act of worship, Lord, that's expressed when we take the, the incredible blessings that you've given to us and we say, God, it all belongs to you. We, we acknowledge that it all belongs to you. And Lord, as a, as a token, as, a, as, as an example, an understanding of that, Lord, we give part of it back to you. And so, Lord, we do that this morning with our finances. Lord, we offer them to you. Lord, we ask that you would bless them, that you would use them for the glory of your name. God, that your name would be made famous in our church, in our community, and in our world. And we thank you for that in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So if you have a Connect card, you can put the Connect card in there. If you'd like to participate, you can just uh, let them know, and they'll uh, come over close to you. Okay, so what's getting ready to happen? We've prepared lunch. Uh, for everybody uh, and would love for every single person to stay, participate, be a part of it. Um, and the way that we'll do that, if you'll exit out these doors and go down the, the hallway that is on the backside here, follow the signs. Multi-purpose room is set up with uh, the food. I think that it's uh, Mexican and tacos and some of that kind of stuff. Uh, and then uh, you can loop back around in here. And once you get in here, we will actually have cleared out some area, have some tables set up, find a table, find somebody you don't know uh, to sit with and get to know them. So, Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you'd bless this food. Lord, I thank you for the team that has prepared it. I pray that you would pour out your blessings on them. And, Lord, that you would uh, seal in our hearts the greatness and the goodness of God. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks for being here. Go get some food.